Hey everyone, welcome to today's SAG After Foundation conversation. My name is Scott Nance. I'll be uh, moderating today's Q&A. Before we get into it, just wanted to alert you all to the SAG After Foundation conversation Q&A COVID-19 relief fund for SAG After Foundation members. Uh, if you're going through a tough time, make sure you check out the comments section below to see how you can qualify for relief. And we've been giving relief to a lot of people these last eight months. So without further ado, the name of the film is Embattled, and it stars Stephen Dorff, who is joining us right now. Hello, Stephen. How are you? Good Doing you. great. Doing great. I, I've seen the film twice now from our friends at IFC Films. And I just want to know, like, how did this come about? What was your first take on the screenplay by David McKenna? Well, yeah, my friend, uh, a friend of mine, Colleen Camp, um, actress, producer, she uh, she turned me on to this script and knew that I knew David McKenna. Uh, never worked with him, but I was a big fan of his writing. And um, I read the script and I kind of flipped out. I thought it was a really brilliantly written father and son kind of twisted drama <laughs> set against the backdrop of the UFC and MMA and the kind of what arguably has become probably the biggest sport in the world is definitely in the last, uh, you know, in the last 10 years, it's just mm -hmm. become such a big uh, worldwide kind of phenomenon. And so I thought, wow, this is a really, a really uh, taut drama set against the backdrop of that excitement and craziness uh and i thought wow i need to meet the filmmaker you know so colleen set up a dinner i had a dinner with uh david and nick sarsikov the director and uh and we all sat down and talked and he thought i could be right but they weren't really pulling the trigger on giving me the lead yet and uh so i went off and um i did uh right i think when true detective was announced that i was going to be doing that um Quickly after that, they made a deal. And they said, are you still interested in doing it? I said, yeah, I have been for about a year. Let's do it after True Detective, you know? And um, there was some fear that I'd be a little tired to go right into the training because, you know, True Detective was like a hundred day schedule for me. Uh, wow. and I, uh, but, you know, we went right into it and uh, I uh, kind of warp speeded through the training. Didn't have as much time as I would have liked, but uh, we got through it and, um, and I think made a really strong motion picture, you know? So I, I really thank Colleen for introducing it to me. Um, it was her instincts and kind of her bringing up, I guess, my name for it. And um, yeah, and I'm really proud of the movie. I'm not necessarily proud of of the guy I play, but um, not necessarily sometimes. Sometimes when you play um, um, challenging roles, they, they can be great um, opportunities as an actor. It was definitely a hard role for me to play, though, just to kind of get into the mindset of this guy, because he's uh, he's a guy I don't necessarily agree with in a lot of ways. <laughs> but, um, it was about kind of pulling from a lot of different champions, lightweight champions, you know, Conor McGregor, taking him, taking a Floyd May Mayweather and how he operates his business and entrepreneurial kind of all about cash and bling and, and kind of just kind of looking at a lot of different champions in the present day. Uh, marketplace and then kind of trying to then strip it all back and create cash for who he is, which is kind of an original, you know, he's, he's, he's his own man, you know, <laughs> no kidding. He is his own man. And I want to go back to those first conversations you had with Nick Sark Sarkisov uh, about playing cash. Uh, you know, what were some of those conversations? This is a very complex story. Uh, uh, cash is a really, complex guy his dynamic with his son jet is very uh uh you know sort of uh i would say tragic in some ways and it gets more more uh, fascinating as the film goes along so what were some of the initial conversations you had with nick at the start before you even started preparing physically for the film you know we talked we didn't talk much. Nick's very quiet. He's a very quiet guy. He's Russian. It's his first American, you know, entry into uh, cinema here. And he took a long time uh, developing the script, uh, buying the script from David, uh, you know, whatever his production company did to kind of nurse, nurse it to where it was when I got it um, was, I guess, a lot different than where it started. But, uh, you know, he, we talked a lot about just physicality. We talked about kind of, this incredible fighter 
and talent that's underneath um, or on top of a very dark past, a very troubled upbringing of his own, which then leads to him having these being stuck, I think, in his old ways and his uh, old regiment on how to handle children and deal with things. And, kind of, you know, he's not he's just not that guy. And he's living in a in in a very old school mentality as far as parenting and as far as being there for children. And he's just not, you know, he is who he is. He's, he's not going to change. I think ultimately in the end of the film, he's still not going to really change, but he does show some human emotion. Finally, he does finally prove to us that there is a human being in there and that it is this tough love. If that expression was ever, um, you know, more fitting for a film, I think that's, that's what our film is. It's, it is tough love. I think he genuinely does love his children. I think he just believes he has to be this animal in making them grow up and, uh, and, and makes it a lot harder than it has to be. Somebody that has a lot of money, somebody that is very fortunate. He makes it um, very hard on himself, on his, the people he loves. But, you know, I, I think we talked just a lot about the viciousness of Cash, the sense of humor of Cash, the overall kind of sensibility that he should be charismatic, that he should be loved, even though he's hated. You know, just a mix of emotions and, and a mix of, of all these colors that ultimately bring you to this champion. Um, and it was just a really hard part for me to play. I mean, coming off True Detective and playing a really uh, heartfelt, tough, you know, good guy that stands for uh, good things and has morals and is law enforcement to the to the to the tenth degree um, in his heart. To go in and play somebody like Cash physically and just mentally, just totally different person was really hard for me to do. I mean, and, and, you know, I'm not a method actor, really. I can like leave things a lot. But this character caused me to definitely become more of this fighter mentality guy um, throughout the, you know, the 10 weeks of making the film, you know, and um, and through the training and. And it was uncomfortable. It was uncomfortable to play him. It was uncomfortable probably to be around me while I was playing him. Um, it wasn't, uh, it, I, you know, I was hoping that we made something strong and, and Nick taking as long as he did um, after filming was completed. He really, I'm glad he took the time he needed. This is his first entry into Hollywood and he really, he came out with a bang. I mean, he, he took time to wait for sound designers. You know, we got the sound designer from Gravity, the Oscar winner. We've got this one, that one. And he waited for months at a time for them to become available and did what he had to do and waited in line. And uh, in the end, we have a really special movie because of it, I think. So my hat's off to him and, and all the production um, people that put this movie together. I was worried about it for a while because I had finished True Detective. I mean, I'd finished True Detective had already come out. I was starting another show and I was like, where is my movie? You know, <laughs> and uh, I was nervous. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, I got to say, I pick apart everything I do. And this is one film that I have a hard time picking apart, wanting to see anything really differently. I think he was true to who the character is, true to the story. There was no compromising. There was no happy ending at the end. Um, he really did it right, you know. So my hats off to Nick and his team. So you know, with all the analysis that you just gave and and coming off of True Detective, so when you're really preparing to play someone like Cash, okay. So there's two there's two aspects here. One's obviously emotionally, the other is obviously physically. And I want to get into the physical part in a second. But first, I want to ask, like, how do you find the humanity, the empathy? And a character like Cash, like you said, he's, you, you know, he's a, he's a hard person to like, you know, don't exactly agree with how he goes about things. So how do you find the empathy in a character like that? What's the, what's your point of connection? It's hard. I mean, it's, uh, this one was really challenging. There were obviously moments where I knew I had to give it um, to kind of show those moments. You know, one scene that I think is important to show that he doesn't think only of himself is the scene with the UFC guys, you know, when, when I'm talking about, you know, health and welfare and pension plans and that the fighters, we make nothing compared to, you know, uh, the NFL and, and all these other sports unions and the fact that fighters should have their own union and all these things that obviously the head honchos don't want to go near. And obviously UFC in real life doesn't want to go near because it's a very true what David's script, um, 
uh, emulates is the truth. You know, for most part, fighters are struggling to, to, you know, put food on the table for the most part. Meanwhile, guys are getting incredibly rich off of these pay-per-views. So, you know, with the exception of a Conor McGregor or Habib or a couple other big draws, you know, the other fighters are probably getting dicked around, you know? So I like that that scene shows that he's a businessman, that he's thinking of other people besides himself. So that was an important one to nail for that, for those reasons to make him somewhat likable and, and appealing. You know, there were other scenes where I think his sense of humor in his insane way kind of makes him charming in a really sick way. I think uh, um, really for me, the end of the movie where, where I'm in the arena and uh, without giving too much away um, with what happens in the end sequence, I can't really go into, but there is a, a sense of, of, of love that's there in an emotional moment um, that I love how he hung the camera on me for as long as he did. Cause I feel like he knew, and I knew that those were our, the only moments really to show that this guy loves his son. And this guy is proud of his son, win or lose. And it could have gone very drastically the other way. The son, you know, uh, might not have lived, you know? So, you know, in, uh, in, without giving too much away within the story, and I'm sure you won't in your, in your way, you know, uh, or in the editing, uh, I might have given too much away there. But I feel like that moment where I'm watching him in the ring with his mother and everybody uh, is, is a very uh, important moment because it shows that maybe I will pass the baton off to my son and maybe my son is ready now. And maybe I was right all along. And now he's finally become a man. And I didn't let him cheat. I didn't let him uh, jump through hurdles to try to get there faster because I was rich. I made him work for it. He got his ass kicked numerous times and he made it, you know, and, and that to me was the moment to act. And that after we got it in the can, I, I felt like that was the one moment that had to be nailed for cash. Otherwise there's really nothing, you know, he's just a villainous person. That's somewhat of our hero. Cause he's a, a legendary fighter in the cage, but he's not a good, not a good guy, you know? And I also thought about what, you know, De Niro must've, been living with when he went and made years ago and decades ago raging bull i mean jake labada is a is not a nice person he's a he's a terrible human being he's yeah. lonely he's miserable he ends up alone you know what what were those themes what was he feeling when he was doing that someone like uh, de niro you know and i i didn't get to talk to bob about it. i know bob but you know, I kind of tried to approach this part the way he would have approached Jake LaMotta back then, even though it's a totally different sport. It's a totally different time in the world. Cash is a modern day um, champion and he has all the remnants of, of that money and, and that modern day kind of, uh, you know, with the Instagrams, with how this whole inner family struggle becomes public to where the WFA then gets a hold of it to where then we end up in the cage together, which is, it was, I thought a very unique and timely way to kind of put together a film in this genre because uh, so much is on social media and our phones now. And so much is captured. Something you don't want seen is seen. And then, it, you know, if you're already a champion, of course it's going to boom out to the airwaves and 20 million people are going to see it. And then, well, what do they want? They want money and they know they can make money putting me in with my own kin. So, you know, I thought there was a very original um, storyline, very believable storyline here. Uh, a guy coming to kind of later in his mid, you know, 40s. He's kind of how long is he going to go? Is he going to be in a cage at 50? You know, he, you know, the young son's coming up. He's got real talent. Um you know, it just felt like a modern day fight movie and, and in a really smart way, as opposed to kind of a lot of the boxing movies and fight movies that are, tend to just be biopics about another fighter we've never heard of that are always kind of the same movie, I feel like, and then get lost in the uh, in the shuffle. So, yeah, I felt I feel like um, I feel like it was a hard one to play, but it was a challenging one. And and and. Uh, and I'm proud of, of what, what we made. Cause I feel like there are people like this. There are, there are families like this. So maybe people can learn from it. Maybe people can be shocked that this still goes on uh, in this way. And, you know, maybe take away something else besides just being entertained, you know? Well, that last look, you know, you, you talked about that when the moment where you really see Cash's humanity, that last look that he gives in the ring, 
when he sees a, a mother and son embracing, you know, and he just like, like he's proud. He really is proud of his son. Um, but look at everything it took to get there. But also, you know, Stephen, not just the, the emotional prep that you had to do, it was the physical preparation, the training, the MMA training, the, you know, getting ripped. I mean, you know, uh, and like, how did you prepare to do that? Like, what was your workout? What was the, the training for the MMA? What, what was that whole process that you had to go through? Cause that's, that's yeah. part well, of this. Normally part. I'd want like, you know, 12 weeks, you know, before I would go into something like this. Cause the main thing for me was, um, the lightweight champions aren't necessarily the biggest dudes in the world and they're kind of my size, you know, but I needed to put on some size because I was kind of uh, thinner for true detective. I was also doing a lot of prosthetics when we went into the old age makeup. So I was kind of more frail in my, um, you know, more lean, but not, not as big as I wanted to be. I also, you know, have trained for many movies over the years. So I have a good muscle memory. I have a really good trainer. Um, named Josh Perzo out of uh, Canada, uh, who trained me on a movie called Immortals. And from there, I worked with these great trainers, Paul Gagne and, and Josh Perzo. And so Josh trained me um, um, for this, but we had only around six weeks, if that, you know, to where I needed to be on the ground in Alabama learning these fights. And we had decided that we were gonna start with the fight scenes, which I thought was a good idea because rather than get through the drama and all the stuff and, and, and then have to go into that excruciating physicality, I thought this was the way to do it was to go straight from training into learning the fights. I know I'm pretty fast learner when it comes to choreography, there were certain moves I needed to learn. I'm not as familiar with grappling and on the ground kind of work. So it was, uh, you know, I had a great team, Chris Connolly, um, great stunt choreographers and Chris Connolly is a great, trainer for real UFC fighters. And uh, I've worked with UFC guys in the past. So I thought it was a great opportunity. Uh, I just needed the time to put some size on. So in the end, we put about eight, eight, nine pounds on and that time was all I could get on. But you know, when the camera then puts weight on you anyway. So by the time I got in that cage, I felt like cash and I felt physically where I needed to be. It was really just having at least a month with my guy in LA and I fought for that time. They didn't even want to give me that much time because we were pressed up against these dates to get it in before the end of the year. And there was a casting change with Darren's part. We, we had another actor that ultimately we got rid of. Uh, Darren came in in the last hour. Being a hockey player in Canada, came in with a, a very good athletic regiment, learned the fighting really well. And, um, um, you know, for a first arguably a first big lead in a, in a motion picture, he, he crushed it. You know, I thought he did a great job and I, it really takes two to the tango in this kind of a dance. I mean, if, if I was working with somebody that didn't pick up choreography, great, didn't know how to throw a punch or a kick, that's a whole other training it can take months and months to teach you that. I think because I've grown up in the movies and on movie sets, I've learned so much from great stunt people over the years that it's just permanently ingrained into my physicality and memory so it's just uh it's about altering styles finding the style of cash we knew he was going to be more of a of a grappler he's more of a, a guy that's going to hit you up top and get you to the ground and then knock you out he's not a guy that wants to get on the ground and wrestle and deal with a bunch of judo he's not very good at that that's not his style he's a scrapper he's a He's a, he's a magician when it comes to just taking his opponent down and getting them in, in a hold or getting them in an arm bar and ending it, tap out, you know? So this is a guy that was very uh, um, physically, I knew how I wanted to play him. The choreography was brilliantly done. So all the moves felt like the characters we were playing incorporated the script within the, the fight scenes, which so much of our third act is a fight that we're building up towards. And, I don't think I've ever seen a fight as long and as engaging and as really, it's almost like there's dialogue within this fight scene. It's almost like storytelling within a fight, which is really rare. And I think for movies, it's usually just cut, 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 sell the punch, boom, 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 cut, 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 cut. Obviously our end act of this movie is a lot different. This is a cinematic virtuoso act in a fight scene. And it, it goes from sound design to no sound to full sound to 
slow-mo to fast speed to real speed to, you know, I mean, it's just so many nuances in that filmmaking of that last scene that I'm just, you know, I was blown away by what Nick did with that. And uh, we had great doubles, you know, I'll credit um, Ross and Alex, our doubles, uh, me and Darren's doubles. They add so much to a, a piece like this because it enables us to shoot more. I can do, do a couple rounds with Darren and I can jump in there with Darren's double. They can get close shots on me over Darren's doubles back, vice versa. They can do some of the suplex moves that would obviously probably break our necks where we wouldn't be able to finish shooting the film and so forth. I mean, it was just a great team all together, but you know, physicality, physical training was a huge part of cash just for me to feel good in the clothes for me to feel good walking posture. You know, I, I work out a lot in my own life, but not, not like I was doing for cash. So I think a mixture between the cardio, once I got on the mats with the, with the team and learned all these rounds and all these different fights leading up to the end one. And then the physicality of literally just trying to put size on and weight training and diet. It's all really diet as far as uh, it's diet and eating and, 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 and strength training as far as, um, you know, getting ripped and wanting to be cut up on camera. Um, and so, you know, regiment diet for about six, seven weeks, eating a lot to put size on, but with the amount of working out and the cardio, not wanting to shrink and so forth, you know, it's, it's a lot to think about, but we got it in, you know, we got it done. And, uh, and I think it was great to do the fights in those first two weeks of the shoot because it enabled us to feel relaxed somewhat, even though there's other fighting within the story in gyms, et cetera, there was a, there was a relief about getting that in the can. So we could now focus really on the father and son of it all, which is really what the movie's about. You know, this is a drama at heart. It's not just a fight movie. It's a, it's a movie that, that does explore MMA to its fullest um, and mixed martial arts and the whole world in which we uh, are accustomed to now on, on pay-per-views and our lives and bars, et cetera especially pre COVID to after COVID it's still going. And, um, you know, uh, it was, you know, that, that was a, a great choice, I think on the director and the productions part of, of allowing us to do these fights in the beginning and getting that arena and getting all the, the extras and all that shit out of the way. So we could really focus on the nuts and bolts of this story. So, you know, your career, which I've been following all this time, you were always working, going from one thing to another, going from TV to film, back to TV. Now, you know, uh, all the stuff that you've been doing, going back to, to the 80s, like what made you want to become an actor in the first place? Um, I think I wanted to, I was on, you know, I went to, I, I came to LA when I was three months old um, in the, you know, lived in the Valley with my parents and, uh, 1973 and uh, I just turned 47. So um, my dad was a struggling songwriter and um, was flown out to LA. Uh, my parents from New York, but I was born in Georgia where he was going to the University of Georgia in Athens. So they had me in Atlanta, we moved to LA and uh, you know, my dad wrote uh, Every Which Way But Loose from the Clint Eastwood movie and became kind of a hot, young, broke songwriter in Hollywood. And um, from there, my dad went on to write some pretty big hits for Kenny Rogers, the Carpenters, Ann Murray, you name it. Back in that time period, he was writing for everybody. And I kind of, as we, my dad made a little bit more money and was becoming successful, uh, my mom wanted me in private school. So they were able to pay for me to go to these private schools. And I was about 10, you know, and I was on the set of a movie with my dad and I saw a kid on the set that was around my age, maybe he was 11 or 12. And I was like, how's he able to be here, dad, you know, and do this. And I, you know, my dad said, well, he, I think he goes to school on the set. You know, they, they go to school on the set, they get their curriculum from a school and there's tutors and, um, and I, a light bulb went off in my head. So the original answer to why I became an actor at a young age is because I didn't want to go to school. I wanted to have a tutor. I didn't like, <laughs> I didn't like my private schools. I didn't like wearing a uniform. I was kind of confused going to these private schools with all these rich kids in LA, you know, movie stars, kids, you know, kids that came from very rich homes. So it was very kind of confusing, uh, you know, materialistically and kind of like, well, this guy lives in a castle. This guy gets dropped off to school in a 
you know, black Rolls Royce, you know, who, who, how is it, you know, as a young person, it's very misleading. And, and I think, you know, uh, there was an agent that saw me in a little young actors class. I think I kept bothering my parents and they put me in kind of a, a little acting, you know, more of a workshop in the Valley. It was called the young actors space. And there were some really good teachers there. Um, Diane Hardin and a lot of really cool, um, can't remember everybody's names offhand and I'm getting old, but uh, I was a, I was a kid, you know, and I was doing improv and doing these things. And at the end of the class, we would have a little showcase for parents and, you know, an agent came, a commercial agent saw me and asked if uh, my parents, if I could go up on auditions and, and they said, sure, you know, if Steven is, does good in school, we can get him to his auditions. And, you know, and I would audition against all these kids that came from stage families, you know, what I call stage moms, you know, the, it, 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 when at the auditions, it felt like the parents wanted the gig more than the kid wanted the gig for other reasons. I was just wanting the gig so I could go leave school and make some money and do a job. I, I liked being around adults. I never really was interested in what all the other kids were interested in in school. I, I didn't really, I played little league. I did a little bit of sports, but I wasn't really the best at it. I wasn't really um, the top dog. I wasn't going to be playing basketball. I wasn't tall enough. I wasn't really, you know, I needed something for me. And my mom noticed that. And I went on these auditions. I started getting all these commercials, you know, and I would work three days on a Mattel toys commercial. And then I'd get another one and they'd call me back to do another one. And then I, you know, it was like, I think by the time I was 11, I had done like 30 national commercials. So my mom was, you know, saving up my money and, it was my thing that I was kind of good at. And, you know, then I went, we'd go back to school. I'd go up on auditions for, you know, and then I got this movie when I was like 12, uh, The Gate, which was this horror movie. They asked me to scream at the audition. I screamed. And the next thing I knew, I was with my grandma in Canada making this little movie. And it came out and was a big hit. And like people like Tarantino and crazy filmmakers, uh, cult filmmakers always asked me about the gate and I'm like, I don't remember a fucking thing about the gate, but I was, <laughs> I was a little kid, you know, screaming at and shooting rockets into monsters. But I'm, you know, I had a great time. I didn't still know what really acting was, but I knew what it was like to be on a set and be a kid actor. And that was kind of cool and fun for me. And I came back with my grandma from that. And then I did some TV shows, guest spots. And then I started getting older and going through puberty and pimples. And then I would be on Roseanne and playing the boyfriend. And, you know, I think as I got older, it was maybe 14, 15. I was really like wanting to do a movie. I wanted to start traveling. And my instincts were I wanted to get out of Hollywood, you know, and just start to see the world and tell stories. And I was getting close, but I never quite got that film. So I was getting good TV movies and working with really cool people like Gil Cates, who's not with us anymore, but Gil Cates Sr. was like my first real director, really, that gave me a um, kind of my first dramatic turn at like 14, 15. It was called Do You Know the Muffin Man? And John Avnet and Jordan Kerner produced it. And I was big fans of like some of the movies they had produced, like Risky Business and, you know, less than zero. And I was like, wow, I gotta, I want to make movies, man. You know, but I was still young and, you know, and then I was like, shit, I can't get a movie. I guess I'll go to college. I mean, I'm 16 now. And I was auditioning. I auditioned for a bunch of colleges for theater and got into Juilliard and NYU. And uh, then I got my first movie right at the same time as I got offered these schools, I got offered the power of one, which was a movie I had been auditioning for, for about four months. And uh, John Avildsen just put everybody through the ringer to the point where agents were pulling their actors and saying, this is outrageous. And I knew in my heart of all hearts, after I got that call, you can quit anytime, Stephen, this guy's out to lunch. You know, he doesn't know what he wants. It's, this is outrageous. I was like, well, I know this guy and he is outrageous, but I know that if I quit now, I ain't getting the part. So I'm just going to keep going. I've been doing it for four months. I'm going to keep going. And I kept going. And that was my instinct. And sure enough, I ended up at the screen test with the, you know, some six foot two gorgeous South African guy uh, that had the body of a boxer <laughs> that I would, could never have had at 17 and uh, a couple other dudes. And uh, but the South African guy couldn't act. And uh, and I thought, shit, well, I get him on the acting, but he's going to get me on the seat. Looks like a Greek god when his shirt's off and. John Avildsen probably wants this fighter to look 
really good and I'm fucked. And um, sure enough, I got the part, you know, and uh, and I was like, what do I do now to my parents? And they're like, what do you want to do? I said, well, I don't want to really be in the theater. I like I love acting, but I'm not a Shakespeare. You know, I, I respect Shakespeare, but it's not my passion. I want to be traveling. I want to work with real actors with with the camera and the crew make a movie. So that movie, uh, I went with the movie. It took me to Africa and London for about a year of my life. Uh, I turned 18 on that movie. I got my diploma sent to me in Africa. I graduated high school. You know, kangaroos and giraffes were yeah. walking by and elephants. And I was like, this is, this is where I'm supposed to be. Maybe not Africa, but this is what I'm supposed to do in my life. And uh, I came back to LA at 18 and I was just a different person. I just felt like, Jesus, this city's nice. And I love LA, but man, there's a whole world out there. You know, I went to Europe. I went to work in Sir John Gielgud, Morgan Freeman, you know, Armin Mueller stall at 17. This is, this is the shit, you know? And then from there, I just said, I want to make movies. And from there, I just kind of took my own path. You know, I, uh, auditioned for a Beatles movie called Back. Oh, wait, 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 Stephen. Oh. I, I am a massive Beatles fan. I, I mean, come on. I'm hey. a huge, huge right. diehard Beatles fan. Yeah. You know, I got my guitar. I love Backbeat. I, I think it is a terrific film and just uh, sort of overlooked, but everyone I know who's seen Backbeat has loved it. Uh, what was what was making that movie like, you know, uh, you know, playing a, a very – uh, overlooked chapter in the Beatles story, Stuart Sutcliffe, Hamburg. Uh, what was that, that like? Was, I, I just love very, that. I mean, very weird, you know. Weird, A, that I was getting all these English, South, you know, I was English South African and Power of One, and then I was auditioning for a Liverpudlian guy and that <laughs> beat Stu Sutcliffe. So my dad is a huge Beatles fan. Lennon McCartney, you know, got him into wanting to be a songwriter and Beatles paraphernalia and things were always around my life growing up um <laughs> i got the script it was a beautiful script i didn't know who the hell Stu sutcliffe and astrid kierkegaard were i didn't know i knew the early life of the beatles a little bit from my dad like you know hamburg and them kind of shuffling around playing gigs until you know where it all started working for them and and until uh 62 or whenever it was with love me do when they bursted onto the scene and took over the world. Um, I read the script as, a, as an actor, fell in love with the love story, the triangle, the fact that they were John Lennon and Steve Sutcliffe and these incredible people. Uh, I realized after I got the part, what an immense um, responsibility this was because, you know, in giving me the part was weird already that I'm playing all these English people, you know, in my first couple big, entries into acting and film because, you know, the Jude Laws, the Ewan McGregor's, they were all auditioning for these movies, but weren't getting them at the time. So they, you know, and then vice versa happened years later, they came to us and started taking our parts. And so it was like, it was very weird, but you know, in getting that role, I went to Liverpool. I met with Ian Hart, Ian Hart being from Liverpool, um, who was playing Lennon and who's just a brilliant actor and still a very close friend of mine. Um, took me around all the bars, kind of educated me. Wow. You know, people, people were writing tons of crap about, you know, what the hell are these people doing, hiring an American to play Stu Sutcliffe? You know, got a lot of flack, got a lot of negative stuff. It was, I was young, so it wasn't, I wasn't perfect on letting that stuff slide. I was kind of felt very pressured. But when I met Astrid, you know, when Ian Softly put me with Astrid, and I spent some time with the real Astrid who was, uh, who passed away this year and she was yeah. a, an incredible woman incredible way beyond her years and her sense of style she created the mop top haircut she took all the early photographs of these guys in leather jackets she she really was like the manager of the beatles really and in, in far as far as putting them together um the way they were when i met her she said that i she felt stew through my eyes and mm -hmm. she started shaking and crying and I felt this very weird feeling that I'd never felt before as far as a, an energy. And I thought, wow, is this what acting is? Is this, is this, you know, at 18, I'm thinking, is this what it's supposed to feel like when you meet the real life person who's lived this story? And now I'm just completely different generation and I'm being hired. Is this supposed to happen? 
and I trusted it. And I trusted that I felt very close to this character through this woman. And I went through the whole movie, like really feeling very close with her until after the movie wrapped, till it came out. She was somebody I always loved and talked to, not all the time, but um, somebody that taught me a great deal. And, 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 and you know, I, with her love and her support, I had never played a real person. She gave me the power and the strength to do it. And then we turned, we turned down, um, you know, we, we made fools of all the negative comments and ultimately people really loved the film. You know, it was kind of touted as the film that was going to, um, you know, I, I still think it's probably the most successful Beatles film ever. And it's probably one of the best because there's been a lot of, you know, hokey things done on the Beatles. There's been some interesting ones that have explored the Brian Epstein era and this, this time and this little story here. And, but all, all in all, I think backbeat Ian softly made the best Beatles movie um, period. And, and uh, you know, I hear about the film all the time from, from fans and music people. And uh, yeah, that, that remains one of my favorite films I've ever made. And, you know, that was right after power of one and then boom, I finally got to play an American in judgment night uh, running around with all those cats when I, when I finished backbeat and then ended up doing some Aerosmith video with Alicia Silverstone. And I was back in America wondering what to do next. And I remember meeting Tom Stoppard and Sidney Pollack, uh, the great Sidney Pollack. And they called me in for a meeting. They, they thought I was English. And I was like, <laughs> no, no, I'm from the Valley, man. I'm from studio city. I'm, I don't, I never been to England before I did power of one. 17 and um uh, and i had this great meeting with them and and you know if i could fool somebody like tom stoppard i mean that was you know i had a great dialect coach on both those films julie adams that i took on to backbeat from power of one who was just an incredible teacher and technician and i still use her method has been ingrained in my body since I've started those movies and I still use it today when I approach an accent, I haven't talked to Julie in years, but you know, she worked with Jodie Foster at the time. She was really involved, really way more involved as a dialect coach than just the sounds. You know, she taught me all about the diaphragm. She taught me all about how your vocal cords and your, your emotion all comes from your stomach, from your diaphragm. And I was like, really? You know, and she did these breathing exercises with me that would put me sometimes into tears and really affect my whole emotional, uh, uh, you know, machine in there uh, to a point where I can pull from that at any time now. And it's like a breathing thing that I can click into. It also is what's the difference between people that talk from their head and you can hear it in their voice when they're talking just from their head. It's all up here and everything's up here. No matter how good the accent is, it's all up here. If you talk from your diaphragm where everything's supposed to come from. It's a lot more projection. It's a lot more um, power to your emotion, to your voice. And that lady, Julie Adams taught me all that. And I worked with her a couple other times after, but haven't worked with her and talked to her in a long time. But I would credit her to uh, being a huge part of my early kind of what is acting? How do I access these emotions? How do I, cause I never really went to an acting class after the young actor space thing, whatever that was learning how to cold read a, a script, learning how to audition, learning how to do a little scene study and critique it. That was what that class was. I never went to acting class after that. I just learned from the best actors in the world, you know, and that was always my, my criteria for what is the movie? Oh, I'm getting to work with Jack Nicholson. Awesome. I didn't even care necessarily what the script was or what the, I just wanted to know who I was going to act with. And, uh, and so for a while, that's when I, started working with all these actors, Harvey Keitel, Nicholson, you know, and I just started learning from the best guys and, and women. And I, and I just, from my directors to my actors, that was the best acting class anybody could have gone to. Um, and it didn't cost me any money. So it was, uh, it was kind hey, of, what, you know, what was that like blood and wine, Jack Nicholson? What do you, what do you pick up from him? Well, it was awesome. I mean, I was in Ireland doing a movie with another a uh, hero of mine who's not with us anymore, uh, Dennis Hopper. I was doing this crazy, weird space movie with Stuart Gordon and Dennis Hopper, uh, which wasn't my, one of my most famous movies, but I still kind of love it because it was me and Dennis and Debbie Mazar, and it was just wacky. It's called Space Truckers. It was not the greatest movie in the world, but fans of that genre, I think, would get a kick out of it. We're truck drivers in space driving around frozen pigs. And 
it's kind of funny teamsters in space, but, um, I was shooting with Dennis and I couldn't get there to have my meeting with Jack. You know, when you're hired by the director, usually where you're the first choice of the studio, you have to kind of pass your meeting with Jack. Um, that's your last hurdle. And I couldn't get there to have that meeting. So Dennis uh, vouched for me being an old friend of, of Nicholson's and, uh, and I got the part anyway. And I was flown from Ireland straight into Miami in like 96 or 97 and uh miami was just booming hot spot amazing time to be in miami and i remember being at a table reading with jack nicholson jennifer lopez michael kane you know fucking all these people really good actors and i was just like where am i i'm nervous this is crazy i'm really nervous around jack you know and <laughs> and i was hanging with him personally i was nervous working with him i was nervous but we bonded in such a way that he's still kind of, to me, the, the smartest man I've ever met in this business. Um, my favorite actor, somebody that just I can't replace and I never will be able to. And he's somebody that, you know, whether it's True Detective, he's, he's watched it twice. He breaks it down for me. He, You know, to me, there's no critic I care about more in the world than Jack Nicholson, you know. So if Jack gives me his thumbs up. You know, you can write every bad review you want. I don't give a fuck. You know, I care about Jack Nicholson. That's what I care about in my heart. And uh, and I've loved him from that movie to to today. And, uh, you know, he's, he's somebody that's been a really good friend. And uh, talking about him makes me want to call him today. So I might just have to call him and say hi. Uh, you know, he's just the smartest businessman, the smartest actor, and just... I don't know. There's just something about him. You know, I, I love the old school. I love the old producers, the old sense of Hollywood. Uh, you know, is it as exciting and, and, uh, and special today? Not at all. I think the, I think the business is totally different. The world's totally different. Um, uh, the Oscars are totally different. Everything's totally different. You know, it, it, you know, movie making used to be uh, to me um, a very special unique thing that was held on a pedestal now you go to the oscars and it's like watching an episode of the mass singer it's it's all just one big clusterfuck of game show kind of nonsense and just bad everything you know my feeling is is yeah there's still great filmmakers there's hopefully more to come um but as technology and 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 all the the media and 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 the phones and the internet and the you know accessibility to watching things on your phone has it changed the business well, immensely yeah we're watching everything at home we're not even with covid you were watching everything at home before for the most part but now really at home you know it's just the magicalness and the specialness of 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 the old school of the warren Beatty's, jack nicholson the bob evans the jerry weintraub's the, those great fucking directors that you know that shit don't exist anymore you know the you know, it's boring these days. Uh, there's very few good movies, I think. Uh, movie business is in shambles. I mean, they're all being made for Netflix and these companies, and they're all kind of not very good movies. Um, I hope COVID goes away soon because I love going to the movie theater, and I hope that is becomes an option again for, you know, every city. A movie like Embattled will be in theaters around the country that are open. We'll, you know, hopefully be in some drive-ins, but we'll also be in the house, which is where most eyes are watching content these days and uh you know i don't mean to sound like a pessimist about the business i just i i still get excited about um when i meet a great filmmaker that uh, you know or a great actor that i haven't worked with that uh, you know got to make movies in the 70s and 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 60s you know to me there were some of the best movies made and um i don't know i just i i hope for our generation, I hope for this business that we can change some things up, but it's becoming harder and harder. And I don't know, the Academy and all these different groups, it's all just becoming kind of nonsense to me. So what I try to do is just learn, make the best movies I can. And at the end of the day, I don't really have control on how many screens that movie will come out on. I, I don't really have control on who's going to distribute that movie unless I'm producing it. I don't really have control on if the movie's going to do well or not, you know, you hope, you hope for the best, you know? Um, and um, that's what I try to do with everything, whether I'm doing a 
true detective or, or a TV show or, or embattled, you know, um, I tried with network TV on De deputy, but to me, it's a lost cause network TV. They're never going to change. And there's no way to make a cool show for network TV because they're lost in their old habits and their old rules of what they need for the act break. And it's all just a bunch of vanilla, bad storytelling with not the most talented people, you know, you know, I, I tried my best and David Ayer, I thought, Oh, this is a good shot. It wasn't, it wasn't what I waited 25 years. I've turned down network TV for 25 years. And then I finally say yes. And, you know, you, you give me bad writing and no showrunner and no help uh, and bad notes from the network. I mean, it's like, no, I was never going to return. You know, um, I'm not that actor. I have no desire to get rich just to get rich. I, I have a desire to be creatively excited about what I'm doing. Now, obviously I knew network TV would be different than, cable or HBO just because of the filtering, the censorship, the, the commercials, the, the whatever, the 30 minute storytelling on an hour show, whatever it is. Uh, but it was way worse than I ever imagined. And I imagine that on certain network TV, when you have a David Kelly or you have a really good boss showrunner, um, you can get around the network thing and create a successful show that people love, you know, now people love deputy and it did really well, but you know, it was the most unorganized worst experience in my career. So, you know, for that to have happened after 25 years of saying no, and then they overpay and, and everything looks good on paper, but then they let me down and I'm in the dust with nothing trying to save something with, with a bunch of talented actors and a really great cast I had, but wow, bad producing, bad writing, and really a bad network. So, um, yeah, you'll never see me on that network again. And the funny thing is they just offered me to be on The Masked Singer, which I'll give them a nice big turn down. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I mean, they, they fucked with me and I don't like to be fucked with. I like to act and I like to do my job and I do it really well. And, you know, <laughs> it's like you got to do your homework, guys. And there's just so many people in that game that don't do their homework. Cable is run like a dream. You know, you get months to shoot eight, ten episodes. And you're able to creatively tell a story that I could never tell in, in a movie like Embattled for two hours. I, I, you know, I get eight hours with a character. So there's some exciting things we're looking at. And I think you'll see me the next time I do a show, it'll definitely be on a, on a streamer or on, on a, you know, on HBO or somewhere along those lines where I can really kind of delve deep and truth, truthfully where the talent exists and where, where people want to be. Um, you know, I don't, uh, I just, it was such a waste of a year. We made a lot of money, but what a waste of a year for me, you know, in, in creatively. Well, uh, last question, you know, because SAG after foundation members are watching and, you know, everyone's yeah. going through a hard time, you know, 2020 was definitely a shit year. Uh, what kind of advice do you have for actors who are not just struggling with the pandemic and, you know, all those other things, but really just struggling just to like, survive in their careers as actors you know it's a constant fight i think and it comes from you most of it i think you have to can't just rely on agencies you can't just rely on the things you would hope you could rely on you know i'm constantly working doing my own things bringing in my own projects uh, you know at the same time the agency protects me and, and filters through all the things that come in and hopefully they're out fighting for things that I've never even heard of. Cause I'm not covering every studio and every project. And I have no idea what the hell these people are doing. You know, I know that people seem to be going back to work now, but there's constantly people getting COVID and there's a big upswing in the COVID thing. And, you know, I had just finished deputy uh, end of February and I had two weeks of freedom and then this thing hit and, uh, I was kind of like, whoa, well, all right, hopefully in a month they'll get this together, you know, and then, you know, now eight months later, we're all still in our houses hanging out um, for the most part. Um, I, I, uh, I would just recommend, you know, thinking about if they really love the craft of acting and they love filmmaking and, you know, I would just say to stick with it and to, you know, if you're an actor by heart, you're not It's not something you can get over. It's not something you're going to quit and then go become a, you know, uh, 
a salesman, uh, you know, unless you really need to put food on the table and you're out of, you're an out of work actor, um, which is a reality too, for a lot. I mean, I've been at points even through my success where I've ran out of money and led, led a big lifestyle and been in trouble, you know, um, because I was, uh, because in a way I put myself in the career path I've put myself in, I've done it my way. I've never taken advice from, uh, to do the most commercial thing. I've never taken the money uh, as the reason to do something unless I really needed to, which there's an occasional few bad movies out there on cable, which everybody seems to have that I'm always like, ah. But, um, you know, for the most part, I would just say, believe what's in your heart and, and don't think it's going to come out of nowhere. It's a constant fight. If it does happen easy and you're one of these guys like me as a kid that where somebody approaches you and you're in a room and you get the part, it ain't going to be that easy forever. So, you know, you want to constantly think about what kind of career you want to have. Do you want to be a celebrity or do you want to be an actor at the end of the day? For me, I always looked up to Jack Nicholson, you know, Gene Hackman, Harvey Keitel, De Niro. I looked at their body of work, They're the generation ahead of me, Sean Penn, Johnny Depp. I looked at their body of work. I looked at Johnny's career and said, wow, he did a coming off 21 Jump Street. He was like teen idol. And then he went and did a weird movie with John Waters. How cool, you know, who would have done that? They didn't just put him in a, you know, he didn't just take a, a silly action movie that was terrible with, you know, for a lot of money. He went and did a John Waters movie for free, probably, you know, these are the same kinds of choices in a weird way. If you look at my career, I've kind of made throughout my career, I've done a million dollar movie. Um, out of nowhere with a, a new filmmaker to a hundred million dollar movie like public enemies to a John Waters movie, which was his biggest budget movie that everybody told me I shouldn't do because it wasn't going to do anything for my career. Well, whether it did anything box office wise for my career or not, I don't really care. I got to work with John Waters. He wrote a movie for me with me in his head on his computer or on his typewriter, a picture of me. And he sent it to me and he sent me the script and I thought it was hilarious. So at the end of the day, I want to be in a Michael Mann movie. I want to be in a John Waters movie. I want to be in a Sofia Coppola movie. I want to be in a Francis Coppola movie. I want to be in a, you know, I, I want to work with all the great directors. And to me as an actor, that's my job. So it's about the body of work. It's about, you know, could I have done a network show like NCIS Hollywood or Mississippi? Sure. It could have lasted for six years and I would have made so much money, but nobody would really care about my body of work or anything. They'd be like, oh, that's the guy from NCIS, um, you know, um, Ohio or whatever. You know, I mean, it's just for me, I'd rather make films, tell different stories. And now that I'm older, you know, I love the idea of television and playing a character longer because I've just experienced it in the best way with True Detective and in kind of a, thankless way with deputy because it could have been a show that could have gone for years. They just didn't do it right. Um, and so my point is, is that I'd love to do another show on cable and I'd love to like in the middle of that be doing my movies. And that's kind of, you know, and, and then I'd love to start making my own films, which I've waited on, which I could have done already, but I, I'm just not sure, you know, right now I love acting so much still that, you know, directing is a whole different game, but, you know, you can definitely look forward to that in the future because I'll definitely be making my own films. There's nobody that knows uh, knows the film set or every technical aspect of filmmaking I'm aware of while I'm acting. And, you know, every director I've ever worked with says there's not one actor that knows about every single thing that's going on. Uh, you know, I multitask like a crazy person. I mean, I'm aware if, if a light, you know, 100 feet away from me has shifted, uh, while I'm on my mark, you know, I'm aware of, of, of a sound that nobody else can hear. I'm aware of, I mean, I am aware of things when I'm acting. And um, I guess that comes from spending my whole life doing it really, you know, and uh, I wouldn't change it for anything else. I wouldn't have wanted to have been a normal kid, you know, sure. I didn't have a prom. I didn't have this. I didn't have that. I didn't have, but I wouldn't have, I would have changed. I would have, wouldn't have changed it in any event because I got, world travels. I've been to every country in the universe, pretty much. I've met so many incredible, interesting people that I could just never have learned that in a classroom, you know? And also, I think I was the kid that needed that tutor to be dedicated to me or one other kid, not fight for, you know, 40 kids in a classroom. It was just a lot going on for me as a kid. I wasn't an easy kid to deal with. And, uh, 
I, I was very emotional. I was like, came out of my mother, probably born as an actor. You know, I don't know what the hell I was, but I was definitely different from my little brother. And I was definitely different from the other kids. And in being different, I think my mom realized that was a good thing. And in the end, by supporting me and working with me to get through my childhood and some of the tougher times, she saw me build a really big career before she passed away. And that, that made me really proud because I dedicate a lot of what's happened to me and the fact that I've still here uh, after all these years. Um, there's been no, no E! True Hollywood story. There's been no uh, jail time. There's been no crazy, crazy story about me that would you'd be like, up oh, another one gone, gone with the dust or gone, gone with the wind. You know, I, I, and I credit my parents for that in a town like Hollywood to have nurtured me and kind of protected me from a lot of things to where in those years where I didn't have them, I had their voices in my head. And so I was able to steer, steer clear away from certain things that would have uh, been very detrimental to a kid like me, you know, and, um, Hey, I'm still here. I still smoke and still do a few bad things. But other than that, I think I'm hanging in there. Well, well, thank you, Stephen Dorff, for this incredible, fascinating, and extremely honest conversation. Yeah, uh, man. Thank you for your good questions. And the Beatles, man. Beatles forever, Stephen Dorff. So yeah. for everyone watching, please spread the word about Embattled. And once again, thank you for joining us for our SAG After Foundation conversation with Stephen Dorff. And please stay safe. Thanks, guys. Stay safe, everybody.